You think we can start going now? Okay. So we're going to start the meeting here. Uh, Richard Vondero, I'm the vice president here of the club. Uh, Tim cannot make it uh, today. He is actually still at work. Uh, had some issues there. So he hopefully he'll get back and uh, get on with us, but uh, time will tell. So uh, I'm glad everybody got on here today. So uh, weather's not very nice, but uh, so nobody has to travel anyway. So, uh, okay, so we're gonna start out. Uh, we're still looking for a place if we can, other than Lime Creek. Uh, if anybody knows of anything, a bigger facility that we can social distance better. Uh, we're, we're looking for something that we could do maybe to get a, you know, get everybody together or not. So if anybody knows anything, uh, just let us know. So on that part of it. Uh, Madison did hit on a door prize a little bit here. Uh, these, I don't know if you had a picture of that yet, Madison, or not. Oh, gosh, no. Okay. Uh, uh, Tim's got, uh, he's got a 10-frame medium honey super, brand new. It's clear-coated, has wood frames and plastic foundation. Uh, it's never been used, so it's uh, that's brand new. So we, we see he had a picture of her last night, but... Uh, he didn't bring it up. So that's what our door prize is today. And so Madison, she'll take care of that later on at the end of the end of the meeting there. So she'll spin her little wheel and and we'll find a winner. So uh, let's see. Madison, do you want to go through the club apparel again? Yes, I would love to hold on. I'm trying to let one in. Okay, here we go. Um, yes, club apparel. I am actually wearing it tonight. Woo! Um, nice. I got a sweatshirt. It's actually, it came in white and then I tie dyed it. So <laughs> pretty fun. Um, but that is. Does that go for everybody that we just sent it to you and tie dyed to make it colorful? <laughs> <I could>. Really <laughs> fun. <laughs> um, but here, gosh, here we go. The link. Okay, share the screen. All right. All right. This is our club apparel. Um, if anybody needs Christmas ideas or um, something to get for your family, um, this is what we have offered. Um, and it gets shipped right to you and all the proceeds go back to the club. So um, I, like I said, I have a sweatshirt and then I got a little shirt for our daughter and a hat. So. Excellent. I need to get on there and get some orders in, Madison. That's really nice. Uh, really nice way to get some Christmas gifts for sure. Yeah, definitely. If you need a Christmas gift idea, this is definitely it. And uh, it, yeah, it helps out the club. So, so we can have speakers and stuff. And then, good job. Um, we have that also our our North Isle Beekeepers Club group chat. Yes. Uh, Yep, so I'm bringing that up right now. So this is what the our page looks like that I'll post, like our Zoom meetings coming up and all of that stuff. Oh, and then if I find some cool things, um, I'll share that. And then, oh, where's the Anybody can get on that. Anybody can comment. Yep. If you have a, a picture or any questions, anything like that, you, you get on our group chat and uh, post it out there and... Uh, you know, people can comment back and forth, and yep. hopefully, if you got a question, somebody can answer your question. Since we can't get together, you know, it's a nice little place we can get together and do stuff. Uh, Madison's going down. Uh, there's, there's, there's Veronica and I out at the bee yards out there. Uh, we're getting pulling honey supers there. So, yeah. So, if anybody wants to share anything, this is on the uh, North Isle Beekeepers Club group. That if you have any questions or just want to share something. Um, and then I also have that linked um, in the meeting notes. You just have to uh, like it or whatever, then Madison or I will will enter you on a group. So. Okay. Uh, the other thing we kind of run across last year, last month was that BMD. Yes. No. It's kind of a cool little program. You can get on your phone, computer. Uh, if you have any questions about, it's basically like a medical deal for bees. So you can go in, attach, and, and uh, click on one of the links there. 
and you can bring up information if you're if you're curious about something on your on your honey or your hive. Uh, there's lots of information there. It's pretty cool to get in and just kind of snoop around. And uh, sometimes you can even find uh, uh, if you got something in your hive, you can bring it up and and maybe you might find something in there that matches up, and so you kind of know what's going on. So I have I have never used it, but um, for an example of something I saw today is um, if you have say your um, situation is you have multiple eggs in a cell, you would click brood, it would take you to this, then you'd go to uncap brood cells, and then it would bring up all these options of like what you're seeing and all that stuff. So then what we see is multiple eggs in the cell and you select that, then you go to the bottom and diagnose conditions, and then it tells you what is going on with your hive. I thought it was kind of cool. Excellent, <laughs> very cool. Very interesting. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, we got some other things going. If anybody knows of anybody, any speakers, uh, I know we got Pat and Peggy uh, maybe going to do some speaking on us. Uh, hopefully our, our club queen, or our, not a club queen, but our uh, state queen, she might do a little speaking. We got to talk to her. But if anybody knows anybody else that would... Uh, make a good speaker for our club uh, for the Zoom one, because it doesn't look like we're going to have probably a uh, get together. So everything's going to be Zoom the way everything's going. So uh, if you've got any questions or know of anybody, just let us know and, uh, and then we'll go on from there. So, so anybody got anything? All right, offhand before we get started here. I got a couple more things, Rich. Okay. Um, Pat has a beginning bee coopers class at NIAC. Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, here is what, um, it looks like it is being offered, it's February? It's yeah, February. it's usually February. Yep, yep February. it's February. It's uh, four Saturdays in February. It's usually uh, eight to noon on, on all four Saturdays. So uh, Veronica and I, we took it two years in a row. Uh, hopefully this year we're going to be helping Pat a little bit, but, uh, I mean, if you really want some information or if you're a little newer in bees or just not sure about some things, it, I mean, it's a great class, a lot of information very quickly, but, uh, you can get a lot of good information out of, from Pat and Peggy and, and, uh, hopefully help you out a little bit more. So. Yeah. And then, um, Pat has we are having, or if there is, uh, we have a club queen and her term is technically up in January and we're taking applications for any guy or girl that wants to be club queen or queen of that or ambassador for the club. Um, if anyone is interested, they can direct this our way and we'll get them hooked up with an application. Sounds good. Veronica has certainly gotten the queen program off to a great start. Uh, this this year has been pretty tough. I mean, can't couldn't really do much. So yeah, really you know. for sure. We're, we're out there doing a few events, you know, and stuff like that. We got uh, oh, we had one in October. Uh, we're gonna have one in November. It's kind of a, just up at the mall, having a having a booth up there and stuff like that. So um, and then we have uh, I think we're gonna do Christmas at the lake. So I'll be promoting the club over there too. So so. We got the things going on, but there's just not a lot. So it ain't like we can't get into schools and stuff like that. So it's tough. Yeah. So that's all I got, Rich. Okay. Well, our, our speaker tonight is Jason Floyd. Uh, Jason, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Why don't you introduce yourself and uh, we'll get started. Well, I'm Jason Foley. I'm the District 5 Director for the Iowa Honey Producers. That would be the basically Fort Dodge cutting out around Story in Polk County and then coming all the way from Warren to the southern border of Iowa and then the western border of Iowa. So I have 29 counties there and a little over fourth of the state is mine for some reason, but that's just how the voting districts are and that's how the districts for the directors are divided out. Um, I'm... Uh, a certified master beekeeper through the University of Florida's program. 
I'm the Iowa representative for the Midwest Master Beekeepers, and I'm the owner of Foley's Russian Bees and Honey Hollow Apiary and Gardens. Um, so that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Um, my company, Foley's Russian Bees, uh, produces Russian queens, nukes, and I haven't yet gone to the level of shaking my own packages because, you know, it'd just be a few here, a few there type of thing. But I mainly focus on the queens and nukes, and I mail my queens all over the United States. Um, for Honey Hollow, uh, basically, somewhere along the way, I fell in love with an 1800s brew maker, and we had both our own separate businesses, and we thought we'd kind of merge beekeeping and old world's crafts together. And now we have a farm store and everything where we sell like um, old lye soap, handmade brooms, uh, beehives that I make myself, uh, other equipment that you need in the beekeeping community. Um, we do creamed honeys that are flavored, just that sort of stuff. So it's kind of how things have grown out for us. Um, I was asked to talk tonight on the slight differences of Russian bees versus your, your, your common carniolin or Italian bee that you can get in the industry here. Um, I'll go on to that. And then uh, I was also asked that for new beekeepers that I go over um, what they should expect through wintertime uh, for just their normal hives, not Russians in general, but normal hives and then what they should have already done up to this point to get ready for winter. So we'll come, cover that in the last half of what I'm talking about here. If you have any questions about what I'm actually talking about, just try to cut me off and ask your question. If you have a question that's you know off subject or whatever, feel free to put it in the chat box. I'll keep trying to monitor that for movement over here. And I'll, if there's an appropriate time, I'll break off to that otherwise. Um, once we get through the subject matter, you can throw any questions out at that point, too, that you want to ask, because I'm just kind of like a thesaurus on beekeeping, so. All right. Slight differences with the Russian bees versus your average Italian or Carniolan. So the first thing would be their frugalness. Um, this is one of the traits that the, the Russian line um, kind of through mother nature developed because the original line is from Primorsky, Russia. And their winters are much longer than what we experience here in the Midwest. So the, the bee has kind of developed a trait where um, the queen will lay as long as resources are coming in the doorway. When resources start to um, dry up either due to drought, fall time weather, killing back plants or any other cause out there, the queen also shuts down her lane. She can uh, go from the 1,500 eggs a day to just like 500 eggs a day. And when um, mother nature kind of gets worse and worse, she'll just shut off entirely. Now you see this with carniolans, but with the Russians, you're gonna see it four to six weeks sooner because they are a little more attuned to mother nature in that way. On the reverse side of things, when springtime comes around and you get that massive nectar flow all of a sudden kicking in, instead of laying the normal 1,500 eggs a day, should go up to 2,000 or 2,500 eggs a day. Uh, this is kind of where Russians get that rap that they swarm easily. It's not that they want to swarm more than any other bee. The whole thing that causes swarming in a normal bee colony is that they get cramped on space. Well, if you get a major nectar flow in the springtime and suddenly the queen is laying another 25 to 50% more eggs than your normal Italian or Carniolan at that time of the year, she's not laying in just two deep boxes. She'll jump up and be laying in a third box. And all those kids hatch out in a short amount of time, you know, roughly the, you know, within a few weeks of each other, all of those kids are popping out and suddenly your hive gets crowded really quick and then the hive wants to swarm. So, with that frugal nature, you always want to be thinking in your head if you have a nectar flow going on, maybe I should give my bees a little extra space now before I run into problems. Um, she can even shut down her lane in the middle of summer. So let's say, let's say July is really, really dry around here and you get flowers blooming, but there's no nectar in them. She'll shorten up her laying process right then and there just so that 
the bees in the hive aren't eating more resources than what they're bringing in. Um, one of the nice things with that frugalness and sizing down the hive really quickly there is in the wintertime, they can get by on just a grapefruit size cluster. Um, and a grapefruit size cluster of bees eats a lot less honey than if you have an Italian hive that still has, you know, three, four pounds of bees in there, all trying to consume those resources. Um, I've gone by a winter time um, with the Russians on having um, 10 medium frames of honey. I had just basically, I was trying to do some overwintered nukes. So I had um, three medium nukes stacked on top of each other. And that was five frames over five frames over five frames. In the bottom box, I had five frames of brood. So no stores at all. It was just the bees in there. And then I had five frames and five medium frames of honey made it through winter just fine. So resource wise, they, they don't take nearly as much. Um, one of the things that people have talked about with the Russians is aggressiveness. In the spring and summer, when those nectar flows are happening, you're not gonna notice the difference between a Russian hive, an Italian hive, a Carniolan hive. They're all gonna seem super docile and, and friendly. You can go out there with just a smoker and go work your bees and not have to have a veil or anything else. They're gonna be just as tame as any other bee. Now, going back to that frugalness that I talked about where they size down four to six weeks sooner than you see it in the Carniolans. Well, I don't, for anybody that's a new beekeeper, you may not have experienced this yet, yet, but a lot of us that have been keeping bees for quite a while, you notice some point in the fall time when resources are drying up and it's getting cold outside and it's just kind of aggravating your hive. At some point, all hives get kind of pissy. You see that about four to six weeks sooner in the Russians because again, the queen is responding to mother nature four to six weeks sooner. When she shuts down her lane, it reduces brood pheromone. There's less queen pheromone in the hive. And of course, at that time of year, there's less food coming in the door and that's enough to trigger the hive into becoming a little more defensive. Um, people that uh, go ahead and hybridize their queens. So if you get Russians or if you get Saskatraz or ankle biters or any bee that has been bred out there to be a hygienic mite resistant bee, those bees, when you hybridize them or breed them outside of their gene pool, that first generation has like a 30% chance of being aggressive. It's just the whole process of inbreeding the bees to be something very selective and highly trained and just the nature of the bee when you take it a step back. Also with uh, mite resistance, in any of the mite resistant bees out there, it's hard to train a bee to be aggressive against an insect, but not aggressive against any other living creature. So while the USDA has done a great job with both the, the Russians and the VHS, and they've helped out with the Minnesota Hygienics, um, and then Canada with their Saskatraz, and then I forget which university did the ankle biters, while everybody did a great job of making those bees super docile, you still run about twice the percentage for having a hot queen. So you can take any Carniolan or Italian and make a new queen off of it, and you have about a 5% chance of having a hot queen. So if you made 100 queens, you might have five queens that are hot, just meaning that the hive seems sort of aggressive more than any others in your apiary. Well, if you took a Saskatraz, and you tried to breed Saskatraz because of the underlying genetics of them being defensive against other insects, you would have about a 10% chance of having a hot hive then instead of the 5%. So not a big deal, but it, it is something to point out. Um, let's see here. Oh, spring laying. I kind of covered it with the frugalness there. I just want you, if you go down the road of having the Russians, in the springtime, if you know your nectar flow is right around the corner, just go ahead and give some extra space. If you were going to go ahead and give your, your hive one box because you have carniolans, if you switch over to the Russians, maybe give it two mediums to just go ahead and have that added space. You can also throw in a queen excluder to force the queen not to lay any more than that 1,500 eggs a day, but 
your workforce is bringing in honey for you. Take advantage of that. Let that queen lay the extra 500 to 1,000 eggs a day. Let those extra workers go out there and pull in all that nectar really fast while you've got a heavy flow going on. She'll taper herself back off after that flow to be normal. And then in the fall time, she's going to cut herself down to go ahead and be frugal for the winter time. So take advantage of it. So one of the weird things with Russians that you don't really see in other bees is emergency queen cells, the just-in-case queen cells. You can go into your hive at any time of the year. I don't, I don't care if it's middle of winter. If you pop into that hive, you might find five to ten queen cups. Nothing in them, but you'll find a few queen cups even in wintertime. And then spring and summer, you're going to find queen cups all the time. They aren't using them, but they like to build them out. You can cut every one of them out of your hive, come back in a day or two, they're going to have made a percentage of them back, and then within a week, they'll have all of them back. So just give up on it. Let those queen cups sit there. They're not going to use them unless they need to, okay? Um, uh, a weird, weird thing that only happens in a fraction of Russian hives, but does happen it can be advantageous, but it can also scare the beginning beekeeper if he sees this. But once in a while, they'll have those emergency queen cells and the queen will lay in them because they got a little bit crowded, but you gave them a honey super or fixed whatever situation was going on. They went ahead and they bred out a few queens. They didn't swarm though because the hive returned back to work as normal. Those queens hatched out, the queens fought each other, and you are going to find a situation where the old queen didn't partake in any of that fighting. And the new queen went off and made it, and she came back, and you're going to have a mother-daughter hive at that time. This can be great because you end up getting massive amounts of brood, and you'll just stack those honey supers up on that hive because you're taking advantage of two queens laying at that time. This does not last, though. Sometime going into fall, usually early fall, the queens will duke it out. It's like while the resources are good, they tolerate each other, but you start getting into the tough time of year and they'll go ahead and eliminate it back down to one queen. I've monitored this three different times in hives that I found it in, marked the queens different colors, kept going back and checking on them and stuff, and then when that fall time hit, one of them just always disappears. So... It's, it's a weird thing that happens, and you may never experience it, but if you keep a couple hundred hives and you go through them off and on, you might all of a sudden discover one that you're like, wait, there's my painted queen, and there's a queen walking on the hive that doesn't have a dot. So it's just something to keep track of. Um, the Russian bees, they typically have a darker color of the worker bees, uh, but the queens can be about any color out there. So you know your Italian queen that's pretty golden? Well, the Russian queen, the Russian line has a little bit of Italian genetics in it when they were trying to make them docile. You can get a queen that's like 80% golden, but the end of her butt will always have a little bit of black. I have never, in all of my years of breeding Russian queens, I have never come across a queen that went full golden. They will go full jet black, but I'd say about 50 to 70% of the queens I breed are gonna actually be striped like workers. It's a little tough to find the queen because of the striping. You know, they'll, they'll match more the, like the worker bees with the striping, but um, they, they still are 40% larger. They still have the shiny spot on their back. They still move like a, you know, a, a, a lumbering bull through the, the herd of the jittery, Starbucks workers and stuff like that. So you'll still be able to find them, especially if you buy a queen that has a painted dot from somebody. But um, just so you know, a lot of the Russian queens end up with striation on them. Um, cover that, cover that. So with the mite resistance of the Russians, and this is about their biggest selling point. Yes, they're great at wintering, but if you're a commercial honey producer, you've got to do special things with these bees to make sure that they have lots of brood in there if you're gonna take them into almonds or take them to somewhere else for pollinating in the winter time. So they aren't really big in the category of the pollinators that are out, um, 
you know, the commercial producers that are pollinators. These guys are super special for your backyard enthusiast that um, is worried about mites and really wants to get a handle on them. The Russian bee uh, eliminates mites out of its hive through several different ways. First of all, they've, they've got the varroa hygienic sensitivity to them. So when the brood gets infested with mites, they like to uncap the brood, haul it out of the hive and dump it out there. So any of the, your nasty brood starts getting removed from the colony. They also have a certain pruning or cleaning process that they do to their body that you don't really see in other bees. Yes, other bees clean themselves, but Russians really work at their body and work all over their body and it helps to dislodge the mites. Uh, this lets them fall down to the bottom of your hive. If you're using the screen bottom board, you're going to see a higher percentage of them getting out of the hive that way without even using powdered sugar for dusting or anything else. Um, and then the third thing is that the Russians actually seem to notice the mites when they're in the hive, not on their body, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But if it's a free-ranging mite that's on some comb or on a structure of the hive, they've been noticed to grab onto the mite and even chew on their legs and stuff and bring them outside of the hive. Now I say that that caveat about the mite being random in the hive because the way the mite's body works is the moment that it gets on a surface, its cuticle or its outer skeleton has an oily substance on it that pulls the pheromone scent off of whatever it's touching and it disperses it's over its body, sort of like taking a drop of oil and putting it on the surface of water, how it quickly spreads out. Well, bees do almost all their communicating through pheromone scent. They do a little bit of other communicating, but the vast majority of their communicating and telling a bee from something else is all through scent. So when that mite touches a bee and crawls onto it, that pheromone scent covers over the mite's body and bees can't distinguish it from another bee. Same thing happens when it goes into a larval cell. It gets the scent off of the larva and the bees think that the, the mite is part of the larva. It's only when that larva starts getting sick and dying from the uh, numerous mites eating on it that that scent changes and they pull that larva out and get rid of it. So it, it's very hard for any bee species to identify a mite and get it out of its hive when it's constantly camouflaging itself as a bee. All right, covered that, covered that, covered that. All right, um, one other tool in your utility belt with these Russians. Um, I told you how they come from Primorsky, Russia, and they're used to a much longer winter than what we have here in the Midwest. Genetically speaking, they've taken these bees and they've dissected them over and over from different generations and different producers and stuff. And one of the things that the Russian line loves to hang on to is that the queens, not the queens, all of the bees in the hive have a tendency of having a thicker lipid layer on their bellies. So they, they have a thicker fat layer on the bees than you have with carniolans, Italians, that you have with the Buckfast, the Minnesota Hygienics, any of the other breeds, the Russians hang on to more fat stores into their bellies. And what this actually gives you about another month of life through winter. So if you got into a really bad winter here that started early in the fall, just kicked into high gear, and then lasted late, maybe not even tapering out until the end of March or April, you're gonna have, you know, four weeks, maybe five weeks of extra lifespan to that winter brood nest. And that can spell a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of saving grace for a beekeeper there because people normally lose their hives right at the end of winter time around here. Yeah, a lot of that has to do with sickness and with food stores, but if you've got a bee that just naturally lives a few weeks longer through a winter time, you're making it that much easier for you to get a grasp on it. Make sense? All right, that's about all of the differences that are out there between the Russians, the Italians, the Carniolans, and et cetera. So the Russians gonna behave otherwise a lot like a Carniolan. Um, it, and Italians, that's gonna be your Southern 
be a preference. We do have them up here in the north because people still love the way their hives just go crazy laying and keep a big brood nest all winter long. Um, that can be great for keeping, you know, temperatures up in your hive, but it can also be bad because you go through a lot more honey and stuff. So Italians are great and they're perfect for some beekeepers. Carniolans are perfect for others. Really, there's no perfect bee that solves everybody's problems. You as a beekeeper need to look at what trends and what things you like to do in your apiary and then find a bee that fits that. If you're gonna be a person out there that wants to be very hands-on with your bees, wants to um, go ahead and take care of their mite problems for them. Uh, if you wanna be a beekeeper that uh, in the winter time, you know your hive is doing good because you can tap on it and you just hear a ton of bees in there and you can see with a, a heat lamp that there's a big ball of heat in there because it's got a huge cluster and stuff, the Italians might be great for you. Uh, and you also get then the, the extra honey with them. If you have a year that just produces nectar over a very long period of time, you're gonna get more with Italians. If you have a tendency there where you want to have less honey that you leave on your hive, then you're gonna wanna go with Saskatraz, Carniole, and Russian. Uh, because again, those are bees that are gonna size down and not eat as much. So you can see how certain bees may work for some people and certain bees may work for other people. This is kind of weird here because I'm just talking to myself. It's so silent out there. Normally I'm in like a classroom or whatever. And, you know, you can, you don't have everybody with muted mics here. So this is just a little bit weird. Um, anyhow, what to expect this winter time and what you should have already done. So really going back to August, that's when you were pulling honey, right? Um, and again, if you're a three, three plus year beekeeper, this is going to get really, really boring for you because you know all this stuff. Uh, I was asked to talk about this because there's a lot of new members in this group, but going back to August, that's when you pulled your honey. And if you were smart, that's also when you pulled your honey and you immediately checked for your mite loads. And if you needed to, you treated. Um, by saying needed to, if you found even a few in there, you probably needed to because as time goes on here, your bee population goes down, down, down. And that's because usually your colonies are getting ready for winter and they're laying less and you know the population just plummets. Well, the mites don't slow down their laying process. They just keep going up. And even if it was just a slow, steady rise from spring up until now, with the bee population going down, you suddenly are going to have a huge spike in mites, okay? So let's say you take a colony that had 80,000 workers in it. Well, by the time you get into late fall, middle of winter, you're at 20,000 bees possibly, okay? And just going off that numbers, you just got a fourth of your hive is what you're running at right now. So you lost three fourths of it there, just diminished off. Not, not for any bad reason, but just because winter time was coming on. Well, let's say you had a two mite load right there. Well, you've got a fourth of the bees suddenly in your hive. You have the same mite load, if not a little bit higher. So you're now at an eight mite load. If you were higher than that, let's say you had five mites in August. Well, you're now sitting at 20 mites per 100 bees that you're looking at there. That is really, really bad. And that's that if you waited until late fall to try to do anything about it, you're already out of the game pretty much. You, I'm not gonna say your hive won't make it because people do get really lucky. Some people do turn it around, but it, it's really bad to, at this point, try to fix your hives, okay? Um, so yes, August would have been your time to try to fix it because the thing that you're going to probably hear different times in the bee industry is you take care of the bees, that take care of the bees, that take care of the bees going into winter. If your hive's already sick in August because it's got a decent mite load, it's already got deformed wing virus that you're seeing, you're already seeing other problems rear up. Maybe Nosema is hopped up there and you see a whole bunch of poop smears on the front of your hive and stuff there. You've got a sick hive, okay? And simply putting a chemical treatment on there can make the bees 
even more sick because you're putting a pesticide to kill an insect on an insect in your hive, okay? So you get rid of most of your mite problem, but you've got pretty sick, crappy bees. Now, any one of us that has had like the flu or a bad cold and tried to be productive at work still knows that you pretty much half-ass your job. Well, same thing happens with honeybees. If they're sick and diminished there in August, they're half-assing their job when they're trying to feed their young and trying to rear up that next generation. So that next generation doesn't quite get the health and nutrition that they would have gotten if your hive was healthy. Now they're gonna do a better job than their parents. So that next generation they can make healthier yet and do a better job of feeding. And then the next one, so, so on and so forth. So that when you do get into this late fall time, the cluster that's gonna go into winter is going to have nice fat layers. It's gonna have good health. It's gonna have a good lifespan to make it until springtime. So that's why I say if you waited until now to try and fix the problems in your hive, you don't got that cycle or the time to get really healthy, energetic, long-lived bees to go through the winter time. So that's what you should have done until now is made sure your mite levels got taken care of early in August. In addition to that, you would want it that you got up to a point here where you had 11 deep frames of honey or the equivalent of 80 pounds of honey in your hive. Please don't ask me to do the math of what that would be in mediums. Uh, to take the dimensional space of a medium frame, multiply it by the deep frames. You just need the surface area in there to be the equivalent of those 11 deep frames or 80 pounds of honey. That will typically get you through an Iowa winter. If you're on the light side, you still have time right now to be feeding them corn syrup and sugar water. Watch the weather. If you're gonna have a lot of freezing temps, that's when you got to take liquid feed out of the hives. And I would say don't even sweat trying to put sugar patties and stuff like that on right now. Go out there in January and February. You don't even have to open the hive. Just go ahead and lift up on a corner of the hive and you should be able to feel if there's honey weight in the hive. If you have a nice day that all of a sudden breaks, you know, mid-January, mid-February, where you get into the 45, 50 degrees, yeah, pop open your hive, see what's going on in there and stuff. If you see that you are running really, really low on honey in there, or if when you lifted the hive, you felt it was getting super light, that's when you need to start thinking about either doing mountain camp, uh, putting a candy board in there, getting some fondant in there, getting some winter patties. All of those are dry methods to getting food into your hives and feeding them if you got into that situation where they're just running low. Um, moisture. Moisture is going to be a problem that every beekeeper faces. That warm cluster of bees, as they're breathing and as metabolism's happening, they do release moisture into the air. And in the wintertime, if you get some of those mild days where the snow's melting and stuff, there's moisture in the air then too. One of the best ways to take care of moisture is just an upper entrance on the hive. Make sure it's on the, the, the same side of the hive as your normal entrance. If you have it on opposing sides, it's just like having a farmhouse where you open the front window and then go to the back and open a window and you get a breeze right through the hive. That can chill your cluster and that can kill your bees. So make sure that your upper entrance is the same facing side as your lower entrance. Um, you can use moisture boards or quilt boxes. If you are going to be feeding your bees there in January and February, that mountain camp method when you uh, go ahead and just put an empty super on your hive and a layer of newspaper down and pour regular table sugar on there, that table sugar draws up moisture into it and it'll actually solidify that block pretty good. It's a great way to just alleviate moisture out of your hive. For any of you that don't realize the, the problem with the moisture is, bees can keep themselves warm in subarctic conditions, okay? It can be like Alaska and minus 40 outside and a cluster of bees will keep itself warm. But just like you and I, if you were on a fall day that otherwise you could be out there in say a sweatshirt or a hoodie and you were several miles from your home and you fell into a creek and got soaking wet, 
you can then start having hypothermia set in, your body starts shutting down, you get delirious. Same thing happens with the bees. All that moisture, if you haven't been monitoring it, haven't been taking care of it this winter time, letting it escape out of the hive, it loves to freeze to the surface of your inner cover. And when you have a mild day, it then goes ahead and melts and drips down onto your cluster of bees. And when they get soaking wet, those mild temperatures really just start to soak in there and all that vibrating of their wing muscles that they're trying to do for friction heat, the bees just start getting chilled to the bone and the cluster can just die off. You can go out there and you'll open up your hive on a beautiful day that's like 55. And you'll find this mass of dead bees and you're like, there's honey all around them. Why did they die? This, this, this doesn't make sense to me. And then you pull the frames apart and you've got mold growing in there and everything else and the bees are soaking wet. It's just like a rotting ball of bees there. And that was the moisture that really rained down on them, killed them off, and now has just been sitting and stewing there with the bees. So definitely take care of moisture. Um, if, if you're a first year beekeeper, think about a moisture board or at least a front entrance on your hive that's up on that top box because what basically the heat rises up and the moisture just exhausts out that top hole. It doesn't have to be any bigger than like quarter inch by quarter inch. You could be fine with a hole that's just like that size. Uh, let's see, covered that, covered that. Some people uh, wanna know if they should wrap their hive. This is one of those things that came up because, you know, what works for one beekeeper doesn't always work for the next one. Ask 10 beekeepers, you get 11 answers, etc. I tried this test on my own hives. The one year I broke down and I wrapped 100 hives and I left 100 hives unwrapped. I had equal numbers of die-off. Um, part of what, part of what plays into this is wrapping the hive on ideal days, it raises the temperature of the hive a few degrees and allows your bees to break cluster, move about, find new honey stores that maybe they weren't on and freeze them up that way, makes it a little easier on them. Well, if you have a winter that swings another way and, um, keeps exposing them to those milder temps or even warmer temps than that, well, then you're raising the metabolism rate of the bees. You're making them active all the time. And then they can deplete their winter stores faster. They can start trying to lay brood at an inappropriate time of the year. And raising brood at an inappropriate time of the year just busts the calories out of the bees. Um, when they go into brood rearing mode, they are expending tons of the energy that they have left in their body to try to get that brood up and going, uh, trying to keep it warm and everything else. And if they start getting fooled into thinking that it's brood rearing mode in late January, early February, they peter out before it ever gets to spring. So you can, you can see how if you have a winter that acts one way and starts going mild early in the season, but never really tapers off, wrapping your hives is a little actually detrimental to the bees. But if you have a winter that stays really hard and then you just get a few break days here and there where this is allowing them to break cluster and move on to honey, it can be great for them. So honestly, take a quarter out, flip it. If you feel like wrapping your hive, wrap your hive. If it worked for you one year and you have a lot of faith in it, who am I to tell you not to? It's, it's whatever works for you and it's whatever you have faith in. But I, I know other beekeepers that have done the same test. I know universities that have done the same test. And it really just seems to be a washout for what helps and what doesn't help because you just have to have the right weather combinations for it to either be good or bad. Um, talked about oh, moisture could, control. Could, yeah, go ahead. Piggybacking on top of that, so you said you could trick the bees into brooding. So in the spring, maybe if I just, I'm just planning to do just like the moisture board on top and do the rest, do the hive without being wrapped. But in March, could I maybe tar paper them like the middle of March to maybe give them a little boost to start brood rearing? I mean, if you really wanted to, you could. I mean, here, here's the thing. Um, bees start brood rearing usually when it's appropriate for them. Um, if you really wanted them to have high numbers for that first nectar flow that kicks in that's decent, 
you could force them into doing it. Um, you could move your hives into a shed that's warmer. You could move them into a greenhouse if you wanted to. Um, you, you would have to uh, toy around with that a little bit because unfortunately, you make it a warmer environment, the bees wanna come out on a cleansing flight. A greenhouse probably is a bad idea because bees fly right into glass and they beat themselves to death. But if you move them into a slightly warmer environment, you could get them to go ahead and brood rear. The tar paper might stimulate them a week or two sooner also for brood rearing there than what normally would have happened so long as mother nature does what she's supposed to. Um, trying to think here, if you then have a late frost or a, a storm that kicks in there in April, we have had snowfall in April before, that could bite you though if you did all that brood rearing because then you might have these cold snaps and you'll, the cluster will go back to being small to try and keep heat. And then all those frames that were on the outside, they just die off. So you lose all that brood that you were trying to do and all those calories. So it, it's double-edged sword. Yes, you can do it. You can do it. Um, that's exactly why some beekeepers go ahead and they move their entire apiaries into dark buildings that are climate controlled because they're trying to just give the bees a nice clustering temperature and keep it right at that so that the bees never burn extra calories with temperature fluctuations or they never get really hard onsets and they can move them out of those buildings straight into pollination um, or straight back into their apiaries and stuff. So yes, climate controlling is a way to monitor that and do things with it. So give it a Thanks shot, a let us know how that works. Yeah, but as a small time backyard beekeeper, I don't have I don't I don't want to start putting my bees into a building yet. <laughs> well, I, I do know guys that have two, three hives that oftentimes will put them in a shed and they just leave the door open. They're trying to get so that those winter drafts aren't getting them. And if they're super paranoid about it, again, this is two, three hives. Um they will go ahead and close the door if they know that they're going to have one of those winter vortexes come in and hit minus 40s. They just close the door so that it doesn't impact them as bad. And the bees don't have a problem going in and out of a shed with an open door because they're going for the only light source there. So, I mean, it's piggybacking off of your wrapping idea. Um, feel free to wrap in late winter if you are trying to get them stimulated into brood rearing a little bit sooner. It may be overkill for the effort, but give her a shot if you want. Um, covered January, February time, mountain camping, the different feed times. Essentially then for any new beekeepers here, you're gonna have a few wimpy nectar sources there at the end of winter time that will kind of sustain your bees, but is not great like when maple trees and oak trees start budding out at first, there is a food source there. Um, any tree that drops a seed or a nut, even those little helicopter seeds that fall down and stuff off of trees, you didn't see a blossom, but those trees produce one. Usually it's the same color as the tree leaves or the buds, but with the bees having a site that's based in um, green, blue, and ultraviolet, the ultraviolet is showing up in those buds and they do see it on the maple trees. It is a small food source for them, but it is coming in there when the trees are budding out. Your safe zone for knowing that you don't really have to feed your hives is when you start seeing dandelions bloom around your area. So keep that in mind if you're a new beekeeper. Pay attention to dandelions when you see them. You can usually not have to worry about throwing extra food on your hives. Um, oh, that covers the last topic for getting through winter time and et cetera here. Did anybody have any extra, oh, do you overwinter any of your bees? Uh, for the last three years, I've switched into doing pollination services. I just kind of kept getting more and more hives and well, it pays a really good paycheck and it's kind of nice to take the bees out of our winter climate and have them come back in the springtime overflowing in April already and be able to split those early nukes out. So no, I don't keep bees here anymore, but I did for, gosh, 10, 15 years, I, I overwintered bees here. Uh, those buildings, I'm taking it that you're talking about, the buildings that were uh, the 
the climate controlled houses? Let's see who did that question here? Yes, the um, putting hives in a building. I was just very curious it, about it's, it. It's very effective actually that people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars building these, uh, these storage systems to go ahead and force the hives to be in a, a manner that they can control. So it, it's better than having dead losses in their mind. You know, you have some guy that has 10,000, 15,000 colonies. He doesn't want to see 20% of them go up and down in populations, um, have some of them go into almonds while others get stuck in a holding yard because they didn't have a big enough brood cluster to meet grade. Um, he's going to want all of his bees to have the best chances possible. So when you're dealing with 10,000 to 15,000 colonies in your apiary, you don't mind spending that much money if you can go ahead and increase your, your profit margin by 10% because it pays for itself in two, three years time, basically. Is there anything special that needs to go in the building or it just needs to be a build? Does it need to be insulated or? Uh, these buildings, they're, they're insulated, they're climate controlled, and they have air exchange systems. Also, the lighting in the building is all, um, it's basically red lights because um, they don't want the bees to see light as people are coming in and out of there and try to have any of the bees come out of the hives and be active and stuff. Just like a lot of beekeepers that have swingers and forklifts and stuff, they'll put either the amber or the red lights as headlights because the bees aren't drawn to that. You get a full spectrum light in there and the bees respond to that and et cetera. So they, they really are designing these houses just to keep the bees a certain temperature and have fresh air brought in at all times. Oh, somebody was fixing my mistake there where I said, I'm not sure which university did the ink vitals, biters. It was Purdue, thank you. Does anybody uh, Jason, I've seen out there, I, I tried yeah. to find it. I thought I, I thought I took a picture of it. There's kind of a cool deal out there that shows all the different pollens that the bees would bring in and it showed like the color differences, but I, I thought I saved that, but I can't find it now. It's kind of cool to, to, to see that when you go up there and you see the bees bring the color in there and you bring this little chart out and you look at it and go, what, what plant was bringing, where are they getting that from? So yep. I, I'd seen it and I thought I'd saved it, but I didn't, I can't find it right now, but uh, I thought it was pretty cool to see that. So have you seen anything at that? I, I've seen those charts and I've definitely seen the different colored of pollens coming in. Um, I know a few of them offhand. I mean, like everybody knows dandelion pollen when they see it. It's just that bright, bright, bright yellowy orange color coming in your hives. Um, if you ever see like in the early spring, a white to gray pollen coming in, that's usually oak trees. It's good, bad. Your bees are bringing in pollen, so that's good. But in high doses, oak pollen is a little bit toxic to bees. But, you know, I, I used to have, um, I used to live in Des Moines near um, Easter Lake. And if you know that part of town, it's burr oak trees everywhere in that part of town. I never had any problems with my hives getting sick. But it, it, if you do research on it, it is listed as something that agitates the bees' gut and is a little bit toxic to them. Um, you get your clover pollens again, those uh, the white clover, again, that's, that's a very light colored pollen. Um, trying to think here, I had a, a really red pollen that came in this fall and I was being told by Andy Joseph that it was from a marsh weed over here near Lake Aquabi, but uh, I don't actually know that one. Anybody got other questions? Did you wanna move on to other topics for your, uh, I think there was an agenda, you said. North Iowa Beekeeper Club. <laughs> there you are. Yes, I was talking to you. <laughs> I... Oh, I'm muted. Of course I am. Okay, oh, okay. If there's any other questions, shoot them out there. Otherwise, we'll probably be moving on to your rest of your agenda for the meeting. Yeah, go ahead, Emily. Emily and, oh, you're muted. You're muted. Um, I was wondering if you could in your apiary have a Russian bee and an Italian bee next to each other or- Yes, you, you definitely can. It's just like 
pretty much any livestock out there or any pet for that matter. You know how a household, you could have a Himalayan cat and a Calico cat and a Siamese cat, cat is a cat is a cat. They all can interbreed too. Just like with cows, you can have a longhorn steer and you could have a Holstein cow. One's good for milk, one's good for beef, but they can still make kids together and stuff and they could still be on the same farm and a cow knows a cow. So same thing with bees. You can have all different bees in the same apiary. What you run into problems with is if your hive swarms and tries to requeen itself, then you're gonna get mutt bees. And that first generation, I told you, can be a little bit aggressive. If it goes out a second generation, it gets rid of that aggression and goes back to being normal bees. You lose mite resistance right away when they hybridize. You lose like 70% of your mite resistance when a mite resistant bee breeds with a non mite resistant stock. It's sort of like blonde hair and blue eyes in humans. If that person married somebody that had black hair and brown eyes, chances are all their kids are gonna have black hair and brown eyes too. The mite resistance kind of goes out the door. The nice thing is the wintering ability stays there. So the, the, Russian, the Russian bee's frugalness still likes to hang on generation after generation after it gets watered down. And you still get that fat lipid layer and you still get the, the wintering traits there. So you don't lose everything. Okay. We collected a, a swarm hive this summer that is extremely aggressive. So am, am I understanding you right that after a few generations that they might work that aggression out? Um, the, the aggression that you can see could simply be a hot queen. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that swarm is going to be aggressive time after time after time. Chances are the very next queen that they breed, it's going to change its temperament back. Because again, we as humans have taken the bee species and really turned it into a farming machine for us anymore. There's not that many really truly wild bees out there. And really in the U.S., none at all. Um, you might have a swarm that lives on its own and does several generations in a tree, but somewhere back three, four generations, it was living on somebody's farm. Okay. So that aggression should go away right away with the next queen. That's, that's well, be, in all likelihood. They like to sting one, us. One of the things that is actually um, an ox, not an oxymoron, but it, we as beekeepers hate aggressive bees, but the cleanest best hives out there are usually your pissiest, angriest, meanest sons of you know what that have ever walked the earth. You mm -hmm. find a hive that will attack you on the other side of your property because you made a noise. Mm -hmm. You don't might count on them. There's zero in there. So the, the, the thing is we always try to take those good qualities and make them docile and happy for all beekeepers. But if you don't mind suiting up, that angry well, hive that you found out in the woods or something could be your best one. Well, they seem to be. They bite you through the hive, through the suit. Yeah, even through a glove, they can sting you. <laughs> well, they'll be the ones that live and they'll be the ones that produce a lot of honey for you. You just have to put a lot of smoke on them and make sure that you wear some protective gear. <laughs> okay, Thank you. thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Jason, as you're, uh, you said you, you know, you, you had the Russians. So how do you get by not getting any of your queens bred to somebody else's drones and get that Russian kind of bred out of them? Good question. Anybody that's trying to do a specialty breed of bees, they need to take into consideration how far a queen likes to fly for a mating flight, how far drones like to fly for their mating flights and who all is living around them, okay? Queens, uh, numerous university studies have been done on this. Queens like to fly up to a mile away for mating. So if you have bees in a single yard, the queens, when they go off to mate, they aren't even trying to mate with their neighbors. They're flying a mile away. And drones are lazy enough, they only like to fly a quarter of a mile away from their hives to form a drone congregation yard. Now, if that queen flies out a mile and she doesn't find any boys, she starts making her way back home. 
and she would then mate with bees in your area. So if you live in the middle of nowhere and are surrounded by all cornfields and soybean fields and yours is the only oasis there, uh, dandelions and clover and places that a bee could live, beautiful. You can have a specialty stock right there and not really even worry about it. With me, I live in a nice river valley. There are some other beekeepers. I flood the heck out of the area here with my drone source yards. I keep over a hundred colonies just within a mile radius of my mating yard here. And if you live within a mile and a quarter of me, I give you free queens all year long. Now, I, I do try to put the caveat in there that, hey, I'm giving you free queens all the time for your hives. Please don't also say you need another 20 queens for a, an apiary of yours 15 miles away or, you know, uh, half the state away. I'm, I'm giving you free queens for anything you want to split out and have in the area because that's just helping me. So that's how I control it. I, I oversaturate my area. I let some of my hives swarm on purpose in the springtime to go ahead and fill in those gaps where there may be a dead tree somewhere. There may be an old barn that the bees can live in, maybe the soffit of somebody's house. Um, you know, no, I don't want that, but you know, that is a likely place for bees to try to move in. But um, I saturate the heck out of my area. And I, I just keep, if you even pop onto the sensitive crop registry thing there, you're gonna see bubbles all around me and stuff there at um, three quarters of a mile to a mile and a half from my house there that is just encircling me. That's how I control it. I also bring in a mating stock from other Russian producers from across the US so I don't inbreed too much and just stagnate my, my gene pool. Very good, Jason. Uh, you talked about honey production. How is your honey production Russians compared to the other bees? Or is it higher, lower? Uh, it's going to, again, be affected. The, here's the thing. You could have a carniolan hive that produces gobs of honey for you because the mother nature doled it out in a way that was really conducive for them that year. With the Russians, you could have Russian hives that just go crazy for you and put on tons of honey. Or if you have a year that goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down with your nectar flow, it might be mediocre just because that queen's starting to get stimulated and then no food's coming in the door because of the down. She's going to try to shut down right away. She's not going to go down to like the 500 egg level, but it's going to be hard for her in an up, down nectar year to really get going. So by an up-down nectar year, you get a spring flow that happens, and then you get a solid week of rain where the hive doesn't get to forage. That solid week of rain is a nectar dearth. And then it takes a couple days out of that solid week of rain for the flowers to start producing nectar again. Or if you get every other day rain, those flowers are getting all the nectar washed out of them. They start producing nectar the day that they don't have rain, but then they get the rain the next day. Again, you're really in a dearth there if you get a bad rain combo with your nectar flow. So you can have a mediocre one. Now, if we're just talking about all things are go, nectar flow is on, and you're looking at an Italian, a Carniolan, and a Russian hive, uh, Stephen Coy, uh, anybody that knows much about the Russians, Coy family was one of the originators of the Russians. They're one of the biggest producers of Russians in the United States. They did a university study there where their hives in Mississippi and uh, Louisiana were all tested against the Italian producers down there and they overproduced their uh, honey by 40% more than the Italian producers did. It was attributed to their hives being healthier through the nectar flow than the Italian hives because healthy bees, again, do more work. Sick bees don't do as much work. So that's about the only statistics I can throw out there is that university study that was done down in uh, Mississippi and Louisiana. How do you know when your honey flow is on? 
Um, if you're a new beekeeper, ask an experienced beekeeper. Um, on, honestly, you should, should start seeing some stuff blooming. And if you're checking on your hives periodically, you're going to notice all of a sudden this golden time where instead of just having a little bit of extra wetness showing up in your hive from a, a, a mild nectar flow just trying to creep in in the spring, suddenly you're going to go out there and you're going to be like, wow, I was out here just a few days ago and this was empty. Now this drawn comb is completely filled out and I need to throw another super on. Or son of a gun, this was a fresh uh, medium that I threw on this hive with bare comb or, or bare frames and now they've drawn out most of it and have started backfilling it and stuff. You're going you're gonna to know right then and there your nectar flow is on. But is there, is there a truth on that? I seen, I heard that like when the lightning bugs, he first started leading the lightning bugs, that's when the major honey flow starts in, like in the summer. Have you heard that? I have never heard the, the lightning bug myth. So, I guess I'll have to try and pay attention to that this spring. I'll, I'll be like, all right, I just saw some lightning bugs. Let's go out and check some hives here. I, I kind of heard that. I don't know if there's truth or not on it, you know, because when you hit that, was it whenever the lightning bugs, you know, early July or June or whenever they come out. And so, sure could be. All right. Does anyone have any more questions for Jason? If not, Jason, we want to thank you for presenting for the North Iowa Beekeepers today. What is your social media platforms and website that we can reach you at? Oh, um, RussianBee.com is for the, the livestock side of things. So it's the nationality, the insect.com. So Russian Bee. And then if you wanted to check out um, our, our supply store slash broom shop, um, it's a, it's a little bit longer to type it out, but it's honeyhollowia.com. All right. And we have Facebook, Facebook pages on both of them. Just okay. do a search using part of that name. You'll find it. Perfect. 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 All right. Um, Rich, do you want to take this next part? Okay. Well, thanks, Jason. That was very good. Uh, everybody got a lot of good information out of that. So uh, thank you very much. So, uh, okay, I got that. The next meeting, of course, December 8th. Uh, we don't have a speaker lined up at this time. I know we're, we're working on a couple of them. So that's what's going on. Uh, uh, Madison, do you have that two P or two Bs in a podcast around there yet? That was kind of cool that you brought up last last month. I love this podcast. Um, I know Jason mentioned you had a bee, you took a beekeeping class through the University of Florida. Yeah. Oh, I love this podcast. So um, I recommend it to anybody. I'm still trying to get caught up on episodes. Um, the most recent episode was they talked about the USDA Honey Lab and Baton Rouge and World Honey Bee Day. If you want more knowledge, this is the place to go. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Has anybody got any information or something they want to ask it before we do the door prize and wrap it up for the night? Nice job, Jason. Nice job, Madison, for lining it up. Thank you. Yep, thanks Thank for you. speaking. All right, then we okay. shall go to the door prize. All right, and I'm going to bring my window. Have everyone's name in. And I'm gonna click spin. Here we go. <laughs> oh, cool is that? It is okay. Dan mm -hmm. Thompson. You are the winner of uh the, the, the honey super. Honey super, yes. <laughs> yep. Perfect. Yeah. We will be in contact with you and because Tim has it, so we'll let you know where you can pick it up. I think it's Dane, D-A-N-E. Oh, no, I well, typed it in wrong, but okay. Dane Thompson. 
Perfect. Madison? Yes. This is Peter Joseph. Um, how am I supposed to get my door price from last month? Oh, Tim was supposed to contact you. Tim has all this stuff. Um, he's been working crazy hours. Um, I I'm not too worried about it, but... Send him a okay. okay. Yeah, no. Tim has all this stuff. It's just uh, getting a hold of him. So, um, I will tell him that, though. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. right. If there's anything else, uh, I guess we'll wrap it up for the night. Anybody got last question or anything? Nothing? So Great job, everybody. Thanks. All right. Well, I said uh, get on to our, uh, uh, our club group page if you got any questions. It's a good place to go in and look, uh, ask a question. Uh, we're trying to grow it, trying to make it better, you know, uh, mostly when we can't get together, you know, ask a question, you know, when everybody's together, just shoot out a question, ask something, we'll try to get it answered as quicker for you. And uh, like I said, just get snooping on it and put a picture out there of your hives or something you've seen and, and just pass it on to the group. So uh, that's it. Uh, right. Thanks for everybody for joining into us and uh, we'll see you next month. Bye.